welcome folks. We are <clears throat> House Corrections and Institutions Committee, and we are continuing our conversation in looking at racial equity, equity and social justice within our Department of Corrections world. There are two pieces of legislation working their way through the House, S-119 and S-124. Um, and they are in both the House Judiciary Committee and the House Government Operations Committee. We are hoping to put in some language, at least um, indicating our intent or our direction in terms of what we would like DOC to start looking at a plan of, to start implementing um, racial equity within the culture of the Department of Corrections. And it's beyond not just those um, within the incarcerative setting, but also our field offices as well. And we know that it is a real shift um, in the way we do business currently, and it's going to take a long time and long conversations from many, many sectors. So we, we're just looking at trying to put some language together to submit to one of those pieces of legislation. And we hope come January, we can do a much deeper dive uh, into this issue within the Department of Corrections. So as we start the conversation today, <clears throat> I wanna welcome uh, Executive Director Zuzana Davis. Uh, she is the Executive Director of the Governor's Task Force on uh, Racial Equity. And um, we will also be having some other folks coming in to our Zoom room as we continue this morning. We will be here until about 10.30. Um, and then we're gonna meet again Tuesday morning at 8.30. And I would welcome all the folks who have testified and will be testifying up to date to pencil that time in for Tuesday because we will start working with our drafts, um, our legal counsel to draft language um, and how we proceed. And hopefully the plan is, is to finish the work on the language to the end of next week. We're meeting Thursday and Friday as well and submit that to our respective colleagues in those committees. So that's the plan. Any Questions from the committee members? Okay, so I'm gonna turn it over to Susanna. <laughs> I have trouble with your first name. I'm working on it, <laughs> um, but I wanna welcome you. Yes, I appreciate it. And anything that you can offer to help us in um, what we should look at in any direction we should be going in, um, we are open to any avenue and how we can proceed here in working within our Department of Corrections. So I'll turn it over to you and if you could just identify yourself for the record and, um, and help us. Gracias. For the record, Susana Davis, Racial Equity Director, State of Vermont. My comments today will be extremely brief because I, I don't imagine that I have information or a perspective that you haven't already heard. Um, jails are a weird thing. We are a society, we're a country that claims to need them, but mm -hmm. universally hates them, but doesn't want to get rid of them because they provide jobs, but also people die in them. And we've just decided through some social contract that that's something we're willing to live with. So it's a really bizarre animal. Um, but I have a few reflections that, again, you've heard before, but that are really worth considering very carefully here. Um, one is around workforce, and the other is around the incarcerated population itself. On the topic of workforce, um, I have concerns particularly around discrimination, harassment, generally among staff. I've been contacted directly by DOC staff about um, being harassed and what feels like being hazed due to immutable factors like ethnicity and race. 
Correction officer is one of the professions that has the highest percentage in state of Vermont employment for employees of color. I'm saying that again, because I said it in a confusing way. Out of all the different professions that you could have, or rather all the different jobs that you could have as a state of Vermont employee, the job title, one of the job titles that has the highest representation of people of color is CO. Hmm. So out of uh, all state of Vermont employees, you will find a higher concentration of people of color in the CEO role than in any other role or one of the highest concentrations. So it's a, it's a workforce population that is very, uh, it is much more likely to experience racial discrimination, particularly because the environment in any carceral facility tends to mirror psychologically the environment of police forces that have this uh, often militaristic us versus them, we're under assault type of mentality. And so there's very much this idea that we come to work, we are at war. And I don't, I don't mean to ascribe this thinking to everyone who works in DOC in Vermont, um, but to some extent, there is very much a, uh, a sense of fraternity among the workforce in corrections. And so when members of that workforce do not appear to fit in based on factors like sex or race or other similar factors, it becomes really difficult because there's a high level of trust that's required for colleagues in that industry to be able to work together. And what we've seen in the United States is that for some reason, many Americans find it very difficult to work with Americans who look different than they do. So discrimination and harassment in the workforce and among the workforce is one of the things that I'm very worried about. Uh, the second is recruitment and retention, of course. And that's really tricky. I have a lot of mixed feelings about recruitment and retention when it comes to all phases of law enforcement, because on the one hand, you wanna be able to make sure that we're recruiting from a a large pool of qualified applicants who are diverse. And yet, we also don't necessarily want to have an overwhelmingly or unnecessarily large population of people working in law enforcement and it's at different stages of law enforcement or correction or sentencing, when we know that we could also put those staffing resources to upstream factors that would prevent people from having to be in the justice system in the first place. So it's a strange balance. Do we pay for more police? Do we pay for more COs? Or do we pay for more youth programs so that today's youth don't end up needing police and COs? I once read a statistic that said that because of the amount of time that it takes to build a prison, the paperwork, the permitting, the public opposition, the hearings, because of all the time that it takes to get a, to build a prison and have it be fully operational and open for business, so to speak. If we started building a prison today, it would not be ready until today's eight-year-olds are of age to be entering it. In other words, if we start building a prison today, we're betting against our eight-year-olds today. We are betting that they're not going to make it. And that when we're there to catch them, it will be in a cell. And so in thinking about how we invest, whether we invest and when we invest in the carceral system and in other aspects of law enforcement and sentencing, these are some of the considerations that we have to make. And part of that relates to recruitment and retention. Do we wanna see more people guarding offenders after crimes have been committed and sentences have been issued, or do we instead wanna see that investment go to the upstream factors that could prevent this downstream result? And that's a philosophical question that I, as a mere mortal, am not qualified to answer, but I, I pose it to you. So that's, those are sort of my main reflections around workforce. And again, I'm being brief because I know that you've heard most of what I'm gonna say before. The second thing that I wanna to turn to is the, carceral the incarcerated population itself. And this is really where we see a lot more of the racial disparity that we're trying to address. 
State of Vermont has now gone, is going through its second round of justice reinvestment. I sit on the working group. I know Rep Emmons, you do as well. And a number of you have been involved in the process too. So in the first round, I believe we about halved the uh, incarcerated population in the state. And yet, and if I may, I just wanna very, very briefly um, show you an image. I'm gonna share my screen. Oh, I am not permitted to. Well, I Phil, will. Phil can do this if you can. Can we figure out how to do this, Phil? I'm going to send a file in the chat if that's all right. And I apologize because I should have been bet more on point. No, that's fine. Thank you. We're just, we, we've put this together pretty quickly. So we appreciate. The Susanna, time. you should be able to share your screen now, I believe. Thank you. It's very, just a few seconds. I just wanna show you this image. What we're looking at is a bar graph that shows incarceration rates. It compares the United States and the state of Vermont with other countries. And the reason that I like this graph is because it illustrates to us, and this is taken from 2018 data, this is the incarceration rate per 100,000 people. The reason that I like this graph is because it demonstrates two things. Number one, Vermont has come a long way, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the US incarcerated rate, incarceration rate. And yet, Vermont still remains an outlier among many other advanced countries um, when it comes to incarceration. In other words, I am so appreciative of the work that this state has done to reduce its prison population, and yet, let us not get a false sense of accomplishment or a false sense of security because it's clear that we still have a long way to go. So what does this really look like? Um, we were grateful to receive a briefing from the commissioner of correction and his data team in, this past spring um, where we learned that in Vermont, the population, the, the incarcerated population remains 85% white, 9% uh, black. People of color generally are overrepresented in the incarcerated population of the state. And that is particularly true for black Americans. And it is particularly true for black out of state residents as well. Now in our state, we tend to be fed this narrative about why there are so many out of state people being stopped and detained and arrested and incarcerated in the state. And so much of it revolves around drugs. We are told that, well, people of color come up from Massachusetts and New York with their out of state license plates on our highways and they're trafficking and bringing opioids in the state. And, but that's not what the data tell us. The data tell us that more often than not, motorists of color who are found to have contraband drugs, more often than not, those drugs are found to be in legal quantities. And when motorists are stopped and found to have drugs like opioids, heroin, 100% of them are white. But that does not jive with the prevailing narrative that it's brown people with out-of-state tags, basically people I, a description that I fit, that we are bringing drugs into the state and that for that reason, we deserve to be stopped at disproportionate rates on the roads, searched, detained, arrested and sentenced. So as we think about the population, let's keep in mind that it's not just a disparity by race, but also by place of residence. And then um, one thing that I really appreciated from yesterday's hearing when Heather Simon testified was a particular is something that she said, and I don't think that I could have put it any better. She said, corrections has the ability to determine the quality of a person's sentence. Mm -hmm. This is big mm -hmm. because I'm sure you've, you've noted politely remaining quiet until I stop talking, but I'm sure you've already noted that a lot of what I'm saying I'm concerned about is outside of DOC's control. Mm -hmm. DOC is not on the road stopping cars. DOC is not checking license plates or driver licenses and determining who is in the facilities. And so, so much of the concern around incarceration really has to do with the upstream factors that lead people to DOC. 
And that makes it difficult because I think that the Department of Correction recognizes, readily recognizes that there's a lot of positive change that could and should happen in the justice system. And yet due to the separation of authorities between agencies and branches of government, there is little that they can really do about that. That's not me being an apologist for DOC. After all, we know that people like Mr. Johnson should not have had the experiences that they were having. So DOC certainly has a lot to work on. And yet the bulk of the reform that we wanna see in the jails begins before the jails. I know that the racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system advisory panel has put together a set of recommendations in its report last January and has recently, let's say, reissued that report because those recommendations remain relevant and include things like establishing a public complaint process with the HRC, um, funding the 211 service better so that it can be available beyond business hours, improving training, supporting efforts to tr uh, for first responder training, including 911 operators, so that we can have more behavioral health screening expanding and supporting the use of community policing, expanding and improving current law enforcement data collection practices, committing to staffing and providing adequate data resources, um, creating centralized statewide staffing to assist with data collection. These are all really, really important recommendations. And, and I continue to urge people to read that report, um, particularly because what we're talking about a lot of the time has to do with what that committee describes as high impact, high discretion points. And unfortunately, this is a river that flows, um, it, it, it changes direction, but for the most part flows in one direction where we're looking at the upstream factors that end up determining who are our incarcerated people and what are the conditions of them being there in the first place. The last thing I will say, and I know that this is a, a touchy subject, I must preface this, comment by saying that I haven't really had a lengthy conversation with others in the administration about this yet. Uh, I know those conversations are ongoing and are being given a lot of thought and intentionality, but I have to say that I am very curious about the practice of housing incarcerated people outside of Vermont. We are seeing the fruit of that practice borne out in the disparate rates of COVID-19 infection among our incarcerated population who are outside of our state borders. And I think that with all of the work that we're doing to reduce our prison population in the state, we can stand to reassess whether we need to be moving people out. And that's what I got for you today. <laughs> Thank you. I think this is very helpful. Um, it summarizes some of the feelings we've all had and testimony that we've had over the years um, and recently. And I guess I'll just open it up for questions or comments from the committee. Um, though before we go there, I do have one of the questions that was rattling around in my brain was in talking about the incarcerated population. Have you had any feedback um, at all beyond the incarcerated population, the population that's being supervised from our field offices with our PMP officers out in the community? Have you had any um, communications in that world at all? Because I think we always look at people who are physically incarcerated, but there's another sector of DOC population. In fact, the bulk of their population that's under the custody of the commissioner are serving, are out in the community being supervised by our field offices. Um, yeah, absolutely. And largely those conversations have been had through the work of justice reinvestment where we talk about the community supervision, yeah. the proposed changes to the furlough system, um, and ensuring that we're not bringing people back on technical violations that end up having a cascading negative impact 
um, especially the minor technical violations that are not posing um, enough of, of a threat of harm to the public to warrant continued involvement or, or revocation of, of furlough or other community supervision statuses. And, and I agree with the recommendations that were put forward through that working group's work. Um, because again, you know, we're not, we're not trying to trick people and, and say, you know, I'm thinking of those board games you used to play as a child where you land on the wrong tile and you have to go all the way back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. Right? That's not what we're, what we're here to do. We're here to transition people back to the community. And so understanding that the goal is to reduce recidivism and have them be returned to communities is really key to how we end up treating people who are under community supervision. So I guess the, the short answer is that the bulk of those conversations have been had through the work of, of the Justice Reinvestment Working Group and the following. Um, so have you been seeing, I know we're all part of that working group, but in your work, and um, have you seen a disproportionate share of revocations of, uh, in those technical violations of folks for people of color? When they're I out of community supervision, is there any data with that at all? I believe that the data do exist. And I have a couple of items on my screen that I'm referring to. I just don't want I us don't to overlook that, that big piece of corrections because of the eight or 9,000 people who are under the jurisdiction of DOC, only about 15, 1,600 of them are physically incarcerated. The rest are in the community. So there's all that community Absolutely. pressure. Um, and I just don't Absolutely. want to lose that, that part of the picture. Absolutely, and rightly so. Um, I, I, am, I believe the data exists. I do not have it right now. And, you know, call me a pessimist, but if I had to guess, I would say yes, we are revoking furlough and other community supervision statuses disproportionately for people of color under DOC supervision. I, I'm willing to bet all the loose change in the bottom of my bag that that is the case. And then my, my last question, what for the task force, the governor's task force that you're the director of, what is the charge that the governor gave you, that the administration gave you uh, for the task force? The charge that speaks most directly, actually all the charges in general, um, the first one is to evaluate systems of support for people of color in Vermont particularly as it relates to COVID-19 disparities. The second one is to look at existing state laws surrounding free speech, hate speech, and displays of things such as flags and other incendiary symbols, and recommend any changes to state law that need to be brought about. The third charge is to um, develop recommendations and possibly recommend some sort of a training structure regarding how to encourage more Vermonters of color to run for and serve in public office at the local, state, and federal levels, including boards and commissions. So of those three charges, the one that speaks most directly to this topic is actually the one that is the most vague, which is, uh, is evaluate systems of support for people of color in Vermont. Now we have intentionally, that, that first charge, uh, the report was originally due August 15th, the governor was kind enough to give us an extension to September 1. We did submit the report to him on September 1 and we're looking forward in the coming weeks to doing some public engagement around that. And you will be disappointed to know that that report does not talk about policing and incarceration because we felt that that topic was so broad and needed real intentional and thoughtful um, consideration that it deserved to be a standalone issue that was addressed, not just as part of a big hurried report. So the task force hopes to take up the issue of criminal justice on its own as a sort of dedicated focused area. So for us as a committee that really, we, we oversee the policy of corrections. Can you, we're trying to formulate some language, how we go forward here. It's not going to be a deep dive 
in terms of the culture within DOC and racial equity, social justice, but we wanna put out those statements. Do you have any thoughts on what language we should include, um, how it should be phrased, what, I mean, we keep going around with, we should look at the workforce, we should look at recruiting, we should look at training. Um, and we don't wanna get into real specifics, you shall be doing this, but more maybe language that says DOC and, and advocates need to come together and figure out a plan on how we move forward and present a plan to us. Is that, we're just trying to grapple with what's the best language we can do. And I'm just wondering if yes, you have I, some help there can help us a little. Yes, absolutely. Um, putting language in there that makes it clear that community involvement has to be part of the process is absolutely key. You've heard this phrase before, nothing about us without us. And it's incredibly important that people who are gonna have, who are gonna be directly impacted by this work and people who have lived experience be part of shaping their own futures. You know, people in racial justice advocacy space are often asked by policymakers, what do you need? What do your communities need? And we say, well, we need ABC. And then they say, mm, yeah, I don't know. How about DEF instead? Hmm. And it's like, you could do DEF, but then you're not giving us what we need. So you can't call yourself addressing the problem. You, you did something to it, but you didn't necessarily do something about it. So uh, making sure that the needs of the community and the needs of the people with lived experience are being heard and incorporated is super important. Um, I think a lot of us were disappointed to see after the murder of George Floyd on camera by the government that a lot of us wanted to spring into action and a number of measures um, were put in place that felt rushed because people wanted to act. In particular, white people wanted to act. And, and I think a lot of us appreciated the sense, the renewed or the new sense of urgency. And yet it left a lot to be desired and it fell short precisely because of that sense of urgency. And so I think it, it's very hurtful for and, and dangerous for communities who have been clamoring for something for decades and not getting anywhere with it. And then suddenly there's a catalyzing event. And then it seems like something gets pushed through in 72 hours. That's there has to be a middle ground. Mm -hmm. And so putting in language that makes it very clear that community involvement is key is, is highly advisable. Also, um, in terms of intent language, I think being explicit about saying we are putting an equity lens on this work. We are not just looking at operational impact and fiscal impact. We want to modernize and make this process more efficient, but we also want to do what is just. And at times, those two ends are not the same. Which two ends, I just want clarity here, which two ends in terms of the financial and the versus what is really, um, the equity language and what is just, is that the correct? Two? Okay. Sometimes what is fiscally or operationally advantageous is not the same as what is just. Right. And so acknowledging that and acknowledging that the goal is justice and the goal is equity mm -hmm. is very key. Okay, great. This is very helpful. We have a question here, Sarah. Thank you. Good morning, Susanna. It's really wonderful to have you come in um, to our committee and really ground us with that with your 10,000 uh, foot view on on this and to kind of unsettle some of our thinking or add to it a little bit. So um, one of the questions I had for you is, um, I think Representative uh, our uh, Representative Emmons asked um, about the task force, but. I want to make sure that I'm really clear, like your position as the executive director of racial equity for the state of Vermont is a permanent year round position. 
and and correct. I mean, and then so my question well, is technically technically it's not permanent. It does expire in 2024, but that's okay. that's for the legislature to work out. Okay. Okay. So my a question that I have is, you know, I know that this for my clarity that the the task force um, was that was uh, created in June to, uh, of 2020 to look at these three topics that from the, the that the governor asked you to, to focus on. Um, beyond this September 1st report, is that task force going to continue its work? And the, the what's behind my question is I'm thinking about, as we're asking our folks in corrections, I think we're looking at, and they're looking for um, partners in the work or ways to engage the community in, um, on this work. And I see it as we have two phases, like it's already September, we're coming back uh, in January, we have a short window of time. It's almost like the we want to set things up for a good, you know, we want to have some action steps. And um, I think I said yesterday in our committee with um, Heather, you know, it's like, I don't think we have time this fall to do a big, deep community engaged process. Um, and I don't know if DOC has the people or the capacity uh, to do that, I could be wrong about that. But uh, so my question is like, is there a is there a something that would a way that would make sense for you? Um, I know you are um, a one person office right now. Um, that might change. We hope maybe at least I'll say that um, uh, to add some more capacity. But if if would it would it make sense um, for you to have the be for DOC to work with you in any way? on this topic outside of the justice reinvestment work um, or is it folded in? Um, we're acutely aware of DOC's capacity. I, I'm aware of a lot of the work that you're doing and I'm imagining your capacity is um, uh, max oh, at, wow. at maximum right now. So that's what I'm interested in get, hearing from you is like, do you wanna be involved in this work or you think, or could you identify other partners who could help us advance this work? Excellent questions. I'll start with the first one, which is the status of the racial equity task force. So we did issue that first report September 1. The other two regarding hate speech, free speech, and public office, those are due December 15. And the executive order specifies that the racial equity task force will exist at least until May 31st of next year, or as extended by the governor. At this stage, we don't know whether it will be extended by the governor. We know that, um, I, I hope I can speak for the whole task force when I say that what matters more to us is not that we exist in perpetuity to keep talking about what needs to get done, but that the recommendations come out and be implemented. So in some sense, there's no need for the group to remain in existence once we've satisfied the existing charges, unless the group identifies areas that we need to continue looking at beyond the um, prescribed timeframe. That said, we do have a number of other groups in the state that do racial equity type work. And the most pertinent one to us, of course, is the RDAP. And so what I would say is that that is a group that should be thought of as the first group to be approached on these issues because they are the most topically relevant and are, um, its members are actually people who are in this industry and who really understand it intimately and do it as their day jobs. Apart from that, uh, the advisory panel that was created alongside my role, that's the Racial Equity Advisory Panel, it's a five member panel. Um, it has appointees from the House, the Senate, the Judiciary, the Human Rights Commission and the governor. Um, and there is a sitting judge on that panel. And there is um, a data researcher who has immense experience and understanding of, of criminal justice data in Vermont. So it's another, it's another working group that you may consider engaging on this topic. To the other question of whether I would like to be involved in this work, yes. Um, I will grow another hand if I have to, just to juggle this extra piece because it is so, so, so critically important. And I may not do a great job at it, but I'll do a job at it uh, with, with the support of those other partners that we've talked about. 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your willingness to be part of it and for your guidance on this. This is, as you can see, you know, this is a really important um, opportunity that we have before us, as our chair has said, you know, and, and we're going to fumble through it, I think. I don't think we're going to do it perfectly on the first pass. So we really do um, need to tap and be aware of, you know, the expertise in our state. So thank you so much for this and for your work. And if I may, I would just like to respond to, I'd just like to respond to one more comment that you made, if I may. Um, you said that you, it wasn't certain whether we would have enough time to do a big community outreach this fall because of legislative deadlines and bill drafting and introducing, et cetera. And I would just like to say that if we consider our process, our legislative process as the given and community involvement as the variable around, with, you know, that, that has to, fit within the confines of our process, then we're not centering the needs of the community. We're centering our predetermined and changeable process. Um, but if we treat community involvement as the given and as the anchor, then we are called on to modify our process so that we cannot move it forward unless and until we have that community engagement piece. So I would urge us to, to really consider that and to lead, to lead with community. And when I say that, I don't just mean hold a couple of listening sessions and say, okay, we collected advice and we're gonna do what we wanna do anyway. But, but really, really saying, how can we create a work product that looks as close as possible to what our constituency and the public say they need? Uh, we have a couple more questions, <clears throat> Butch and then Carl. Thanks, Alice and uh, Susanna. Welcome to our committee. Uh, I guess mostly a, a little bit of a background that I remember from our committee here is that you pointed out a lot of thoughts that you have in your, in your work. Um, and I don't think this committee will disagree with anything that you said because we've been, uh, we're, we are the policy committee for corrections. We, we, take, we take pretty deep dives into corrections. And, con and, uh, uh, and coincidentally, we also are the policy and money committee for the institutions committee. So when you talk about building prisons, uh, it's, it's not foreign to us. Uh, we, we understand that process pretty well. Uh, I think your target dates are about right on. Uh, and so that's great. Uh, we, uh, we also don't like out of state prisoners. Uh, we would, we've been working diligently to get those folks back home, keep running into a roadblock here and there. Uh, but we're, we, it's, we're conscious of that and cognizant of that. And we're always looking to do that process better uh, and try to make sure that those folks, if, if they're incarcerated and if they need to be incarcerated are serving their sentences within the boundaries of the state. So that's, that's something near and dear to, to me and, and, and to the committee. And I look for your help on that uh, because uh, not only is it a, a bad public policy uh, to have these folks serving out of state, it's, uh, it's also a bad financial decision to have that happen. So it's a kind of a two pronged process uh, for me uh, and you know, you know, you should know we as a legislature have have been, and you talk about working on the front end of people coming into the uh, Department of Corrections and into the justice system. Uh, we as a legislature missed the mark maybe two or three years ago with a report that we asked uh, uh, corrections to generate, uh, talking about uh, disparities in the uh, in the population of our of, of our, our, our incarcerated population. And corrections worked diligently on that report. And the final piece of the report that I took away from that was we asked the wrong people to do the report. Uh, we asked the people on the back end and not the front end. So I think I'm hoping that the legislature today is looking more at the front end. And I appreciate you uh, making that statement because I think that's the important piece uh, here. But once they come into, into corrections, uh, I'm, you, you talked about hazing and harassment uh, of, of people of color uh, in, 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 the, uh, uh, in the correction system. Uh, 
first time I've heard anybody say that, uh, but I'm not surprised to hear that. Uh, so thank you for, for talking about that. And I'm sure you and uh, Heather Simons have had conversations about that. And thank you for having conversations with her. She was very uh, upbeat and enthusiastic about your work with her as, as they move forward. And, and I, for one, appreciate that. Uh, recruitment and retention. Um, anything you can say to help us with that? That would be, that would be uh, a big thing. Mm -hmm. How do we, how do we attract uh, not only people of color but people that want to do this this important job? Uh, how do how do we do that? And how do we improve the process? So looking for suggestions there. This this may all come about maybe in the next legislative session because we talked about and you just talked about you know what can we do between now and January? Uh, not. We, well, one thing we can do is make sure that we keep talking about this and try to figure it out. And thank you. Uh, the, uh, I, I guess the, 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 the biggest thing that I'd like to, to leave with and, and maybe have you comment on is, is we need, uh, as a policy committee, we need suggestions from, from your group and, and from the, uh, the working group on S338 and, and JR2, um, which came out of our committee, by the way, so we're pretty familiar with that. Uh, and we need suggestions because we don't, the, the 11 of us on the committee don't have the answers. Uh, I, I think it's our job to listen to the, the people in the community and, and others to try to figure out the best path to go. And if we're going down the wrong path, please tell us. We often don't know because we have a lot of things on our plate, and that's not an excuse; it's an explanation. But so anyway, I guess that's my 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 soapbox, and, and, and thank you. And I was expand. You. I would expand a little bit, Butch, on what you were saying about we don't know because we have a lot on our plate. Personally, I'm not speaking for the committee, but personally. It's like, I don't know because I haven't experienced it. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I haven't experienced the situations that people of color have experienced. We think we've experienced it, but we haven't. And, and, we, hmm? and we talk about that. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 I, and I agree. Uh, we just don't know. You've been here a little while, you, uh, Susanna, and you understand the culture a little bit of, of what's going on around here, whether it's right or wrong. And you, you've seen it, so so we need we need to be trained. I mean, we can see what happens, and we have been seeing it on our TV screens over the summer, and it's appalling, and and it jars you, and it makes you want to do something to make it right. And we experience it, but we may experience it at a very different level than the community of color experiences it. And it's, we come at it from our experience, which may be very, very, and is very, very different. And I don't want to discount anyone's feelings. Um, I'm just speaking personally. We want to do we want to go forward in a healthy manner that's very inclusive. We need help to do that. So we have another question, Carl. Good morning, Susanna, and thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I I know you're know you're busy and. Um, we really, or I really appreciate your spending the time with us to to work through through our our work and and figure out where to where to go next. Um, you said something that uh, you know yesterday when Heather was um, with us, I asked her some questions about um, grievance procedures, and we spoke a little bit about that, but mostly on the on the incarcerated um, side of things, not on the workforce side, and. You know, we've heard from DOC that the problems with retention are uh, are due to too much overtime or forced overtime or they're due to supervisory issues. But um, you know, you really opened my eyes up this morning. I did I did not know that um, uh, 
corrections officers make up the largest uh, proportion of people of color who work for the state. Um, and I am really disappointed to hear that, although like Butch, not surprised, really disappointed to hear that there's discrimination and harassment among that um, in that workforce around ethnicity and race. And um, I'm wondering if you have any information, either anecdotal or otherwise, about what what's happened in those situations. Have have people brought grievances? Have they just said, you know what, I don't want to work here and left, or uh, or something else that I'm not, you know, that that maybe you know about that I don't. I, I'm I'm just really struck by by that because we 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 can't afford to lose good people. And especially for something, um, for something like that, it, it, that's really, it's disheartening to hear. Um, and so I'm, I'm just wondering if you've got any more information for us about that. What I can say is that this is not, um, it's not rare. It's not rare at all. A lot of people don't come forward. One, because of retaliation or embarrassment or shame or because they've internalized that this is what their life is like and is going to be like and why struggle. Um, so yeah, this is definitely something that needs to be addressed and it's gonna have to be addressed whether or not we have cooperation from people who are experiencing it. I mean, obviously you wanna protect people and you wanna make sure that no one's being um, harmed or railed Wrote it through the process, um, but but it's clear that intimidation is very real, and that if we do not act on vulnerable people's behalf, then they will continue to be vulnerable. And I've just sent you in the chat uh, an image that shows that distribution of job titles and SOV that we talked about, just for you all to review at your leisure. Um, I think that we need to find a mechanism through which people feel comfortable coming forward. And that may be different than the existing mechanism. Um, this is something that we experience in a lot of workplaces. People say, well, there's a reporting structure. Why didn't they come forward? Or why didn't they report it? Well, the person they're supposed to report it to is the guy who's doing it. Or, well, they've seen this happen before and every single time, the, the agency takes the side of management or they think of it as a risk, risk reduction from a risk, risk reduction perspective. Like how do we avoid a lawsuit? Um, as opposed to saying, how do we find a just end to the situation and do right by the complainant? So there, there may need to be a parallel structure or a rethinking of the existing structure to make sure that people feel comfortable enough engaging in this process. And then I think you'd be shocked to find a lot of people come forward. And it very much is a cascade, right? When one person comes forward, then suddenly a kajillion people do who've just been holding on to it and haven't felt brave enough to say anything until that one person does. I don't know if I've even addressed your question. I just talked around it, but. Well, I didn't, I didn't necessarily <laughs> know that you'd have an answer for me, but I, I appreciate your, your comments. I mean, I, I was asking you sort of, something that you probably have anecdotal information about, but I, I really appreciate your bringing this up because uh, I think it's, um, you know, of all, all the problems and, and the commissioner talks about the issues around culture, this has got to be part of that discussion too, um, because the problems that it causes in the, within the structure of the workforce are, are are very real if what you're telling us is true. And I have no reason to doubt that at all. So thank you. And I'd you. like to say, um, thank you. Um, and just one other thing about the impact on the workplace. I think a lot of times we don't really recognize how much um, discrimination in the workplace hurts the organization. Um, a lot of reports, and I'm blanking on the numbers, but um, I think 80% of people who have either experienced or witnessed bias and discrimination in the workforce, 80% of them say they give less effort at their jobs as a result. I think 11, uh, I think there's an 11% drop in productivity 
and a 17% drop in focus and attention and skilled work. And again, we're talking about a workforce that needs to be sharp and needs to be on point and needs to have its crap together. And so when we have people who are being harassed in the workplace and it's already a workplace with heightened security concerns, one error or one oversight could, could really end very poorly. So it's particularly important in workplaces like that, that the team be a team. And if, the, if what you're talking about is going on, then there's not much team there. Thank you. So another committee member has a question, but I want to intervene here in a minute, just for clarity, because my I was diverted a little bit in this conversation with some other things. So when we're talking about the harassment in the workforce, I just we were just talking about um, staff to staff, correct? So I'm looking back on the notes and saying that of the state employment of employment within the state of Vermont of state employees, um, the highest concentration of people of color who are employed by the state are COs. Are you, have you had any reports of incarcerated inmates harassing staff who are people of color? I have not heard those reports directly. I am sure that it happens, but I have no, I do not yet have data to show that. So I think that's another piece that we also need to be very aware um, that is a situation, I would think. So we've got a couple more questions, Kurt and then Butch. Um, when, when I think of workforce, I also think of um, the VSEA and the union that represents them. Um, and there would seem to me if there are complaints and uh, things like this going on in the workforce, the VSEA should be aware of them and should be working on them as well. I, know, I don't know whether they accept that role or not, but it seems to me a, a valid thing for an association of the state employees to be working on. Have, has, do you know anything about any contact with them or any uh, word through them about these sorts of issues? I, I don't, I haven't heard. Okay. We have reached out to VSEA to come in and testify. There's been some conflicts with Steve Howard's schedule. Um, he was due, we were hoping to have him in this morning, um, but then he was double, triple booked. And um, I have indicated to Phil that we would have some time first thing Tuesday morning to hear from him. And uh, hopefully that will work out. Adam Chair, he has he has confirmed just a couple of minutes ago for Tuesday, first thing. Okay, great. Okay, Butch. Thanks, uh, Alice. Uh, Susanna, thank you for sending us that that report. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm wondering, uh, and maybe a question for Phil too. Can you, we get that downloaded to our? Oh, it is. Our, well, you did, <laughs> did that. Thank yeah. you very much. That's one of the uh, things I was doing. It's going to be posted on our web page. I was trying to do the same thing. I was trying to download it. I was having trouble downloading it because I know when we go off, we lose the chat. So I, yeah. I don't. You mean the you mean the chart that I sent over with the, the minority title? report no. that you just sent in your chat? Yeah. Phil okay. has already done that it. Actually... Okay, great. <laughs> Phil has done it to put it on our web page, right, Nothing. Phil? <laughs> yes, I downloaded it to the desktop and we'll put it up on our web page a little later. Oh, uh, thank you very much. The, uh, the the beauty of Zoom, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> That's why I was distracted. Carl, questions. Yeah. Thanks. And just for um, just to dot the I's and cross the T's, that comes from the State of Vermont Workforce Report from fiscal 2019. I've just put the link in the chat as well. Okay. Yeah, I, I would I would point out on those charts that. Uh, CO1 and CO2 are listed separately. So if you were to combine those categories is where you see bigger jumps. Okay, that's good. And maybe we could put this link to uh, Phil to our webpage because Butch is right. When we sign off a of Zoom, we lose the, the okay. chat. 
Anything else for Susanna? Susanna, I'm sorry, I struggle. <laughs> I want to call you Susanna. <laughs> Susanna. Um, anything else before we go over to Anthony Marks? Um, Anthony was is scheduled at 9:30, and I had said to Phil to let Anthony in earlier so that he could at least get a flavor of our conversation and discussions. So, anything else for Susanna? You're welcome to stay on. Um, we're, you know, we are scheduled until 10:30. What I'm hoping to do after uh, Anthony's testimony to maybe start grappling with the committee in terms of what we need to do for language. We have Becky Wasserman with us, who's a drafts person that at least can get a flavor of what direction we're going in so that we can have some language before us on Tuesday morning. And I would, it, uh, I know you heard this, Susanna and Anthony has not, but I would encourage as many people to be available if you can on Tuesday morning at 8.30 to zoom in with us while we start walking through our proposed language because we're gonna need everyone's feedback for that. So connect with Phil, Phil's our key person. Okay. Thank you. I do have to jump off um, because I have another meeting with, with Secretary Young, um, but I look forward to, to trying to pop in on Tuesday. That'll over, uh, it'll overlap with our cabinet meeting, but as soon as we're done there, I'll, I'll come on over. That's great. That's good. Thank you. Susanna, real quick you before all. you leave. Before, before you, you leave, leave, Susanna. Before you leave, I want to thank you so much. Um, and this is just honestly like, unfortunately, obviously, all these people are on here when I'm thanking you, period. But I, I do want to let you know that like when we, when we, the Black community, talk about Black excellence, um, I think you represent that, that statement in every aspect of it. And so, wow. again, like, yeah, thank you. Live up to that. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. That's that's big. Thank you very much for saying that. Absolutely. Great. Okay. Gracias, everyone. Thank you. We'll see you Tuesday. So, Anthony, we're gonna we're gonna shift over to you, and I hope you've gotten sort of a, a flavor of what we're kind of thinking. Um, as I stated at the very beginning of our meeting, there's, as you well know, there's two. Um, legislative bills, Senate bills that are working through the House, S-119, S-124. Um, they're dealing with law enforcement and training. And a big piece of the criminal justice system is corrections. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't think about corrections. They're thinking of law enforcement in the courts. But corrections is the one that houses the folks that come from that feeder system. Of course. Um, and I felt it was appropriate in our role as House Corrections and Institutions Committee that oversees the policy of corrections to have a place at the table and to uh, put in some language in one of those bills to really start looking at racial equity and social justice within our corrections. So that's what we're looking at. It's not gonna be anything um, a deep dive because we just don't have the time, but it will it will set the table for us to really do that deep dive come January. So any thoughts, any um, direction you can give us would be really appreciative. So I'll turn it over to you, Anthony, if you could introduce yourself for the record, um, and then we'll go from there. Absolutely. Well, my name is Anthony Marquez. I've actually been doing a lot of work around the state, um, obviously of Vermont, doing different types of, I'm a huge, I'm huge into videography, cinematography, storytelling, and I've been really documenting the, um, the protests that we've seen all over the state. As you guys know, this is a huge, like this is, this is such a different time. This is history being made every single day in the state. And it's not necessarily, um, the, the right side of history all the time, but it is definitely allowing us to see that ugly, that ugly invisible face that Vermont pretends to, to not have or exist here. And um, throughout that work, what I've noticed is how many people literally just don't know and how many people use that excuse as, well, we, we had no idea Vermont um, had racial racial issues. We had no, no no idea that Vermont possessed this sort of um, racism and whatever the case may be. But for me, it's like, 
even if you didn't know, that does not that does not mean you shouldn't have been doing the work forever ago. And I think a lot of these conversations that we're having um, day in and day out, week in and week out, as far as the black community is concerned, is it's, it's educational more or less than it is furthering the conversation. Like we're literally, a lot of people are unlearning their, their, their views of what race looks like or racism looks like in the state and a little bit a little bit of that is scary because a lot of those people that are having to to undo those thoughts that they they grew up with um honestly look like you individuals on this call right now mm -hmm. and so we're really we're really like I, i've been in a position where i'm really pushing that narrative of like do the work don't just assume that you know just because you're in a position to understand obviously this call um you guys being who you are it, it, it to me it's a little it's a little scary because when i hear we're, we're looking to um we're looking to put language into a narrative to me it's almost like you're looking to pick little pieces here and there to fit whatever narrative you guys are trying to um accomplish or push and and that as a black man is a very um to me, that's very undermining. That's undermining the realization that there are real things happening in this world, especially in this, my bad, there are real things happening in this world and the state of Vermont is not exempt from those real things. Um, this stuff has been happening for a very, very, very long time. Um, and actually, <clears throat> excuse me, sir, uh, Butch, sir, um, there's something that you had distinctively said um, that like stuck with me a little bit. And you talked about how you understand the number of incarceration um, for out-of-staters is extremely high in the state of Vermont. And you said you guys are working on, um, pretty much you're working on something that would allow that number to decrease. Um, and I think my, my biggest overall question at that time was, are we talking about the the black end of like the, the black community like are we, are we talking about um african americans or 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 brown people indigenous people are we talking about that community or are we talking about just in general like the, the incarceration whole numbers so the whole community the whole community we have, yeah we have right now I, what we're focusing when we say we are incarcerating folks out of state we have a contract with a private entity and we've mm -hmm. had contracts for 25 years yeah. of housing Vermont offenders out of state because we don't have the bed space within yes. our current facilities. Yes. Right now we have about 217 folks yeah. who are sentenced here in Vermont, have an mm -hmm. incarcerated sentence here in Vermont, but due to the lack of space within our current facilities. It's like Missi Mississippi, right? Right, they're being housed right now in Mississippi We've been wanting to bring all of our offenders who have been housed in out-of-state beds because we don't have the capacity here in Vermont yeah. to bring them all back. Yeah. Okay. So okay. That's okay. what Representative Shaw was referring to. Okay. Okay. Cool. 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 And, and thank you. Thank you. Now, that's mm -hmm. that cleared everything up for me as far as that's concerned. So thank you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, like honestly, like this is guys. This is stuff that clearly I could talk about all day. But what I really want to stress the importance of and I think um as you were saying earlier you're white a lot of these experiences that like are being talked about are something that you I mean you just don't know because you've never personally experienced what it's like to even be a black man or a black woman in a predominantly white space and what I would beg you guys to get a better understanding of and I think it's very I think it could, I think it's very simple if we're looking at it from a micro perspective. We got to understand there is a specific type of person running for two correction officer jobs. There is a specific type of person. And every now and then, somebody who has values, morals, integrity signs up for a job like that. Every now and then that happens, but nine times out of 10, there is a specific type of person, individual, that is running to these jobs. And within two to three weeks, they have the power of putting somebody in the hole for two weeks at a time. 
like literally taking them from a space that's already uncomfortable and taking them completely out of that space and then locking them in a cage that has no light, that has no rec time, that has no, like you can't, you can't call your support system at all throughout the day unless it's from one to one thirty or seven to seven thirty, and then all of a sudden, what happens is now they learn their lessons. So what we do is we take these individuals that we locked up in these like specific holes, and then we put them right back into whatever community they have built throughout um, throughout their time being in jail. And, and to me, what that automatically does to the human mind, what that does to like your psyche in general is, I mean, there's words that I really wanna use on this call right now that I'm not using, <laughs> but understand like what that ultimately does is, excuse my language, but it fucks you up. Like it, re it really messes with you in a way that is so hard to truly explain to you guys as individuals, but like without being on a Zoom call, I feel like this is a conversation for in-person, um, it, it, it's really tough. It's just hard to take something that is so familiar because you're forced to get used to that, take them out of that familiarity. And then two weeks later, try to integrate them back into that system, that same community and expect them to have a good day. Expect them to, to be able to look at individuals that again, sign up for these jobs because of power, because of that, that, that physical, I want to control you mind frame that mindset and then you put these individuals that are struggling just to get by day to day with these individuals and i mean so so many so many so many scenarios and situations are overreactions you know what i mean like these people that like are in control of these individuals they overreact on these guys like like that's their job and from for me for instance it's just i don't i don't see power in that i don't see how that is doing your job and when we talk about like race that is huge when it comes to like one like i'm not sure who it was um but someone on this call had said it was the first time they had ever heard they had or either the first time they had heard or it was one of the first times they had heard individuals mistreating inmates or vice versa and to me it's just like are you serious like you're in this position, but like you don't realize that's a thing. And ultimately what that tells me is we, we, not just you, but we as individuals are not doing the work to ensure the safety and to ensure the, uh, and, and to ensure a better understanding, a deeper understanding of what's actually going on behind closed doors. Um, I mean, Miss Davis, she, I mean, she, she touched base on it. She literally stated, and I quote, <clears throat> the work is literally, the work can't be done if we can like consistently turn a blind to it. And the work definitely can't be done if the people that are doing the harm are the ones in control of changing it. And I think ultimately when we, when we view, when we look at that from a concrete perspective, we really need to take a step back and be like, First and foremost, who are we employing? Like, who are we, who are we saying like, yeah, you're fit for this job? And if those individuals are a specific type of person, um, I think we need to look at that specific type of person and then decide from there, like, how can we do a better job of, <clears throat> how can DOC do a better job? Because again, when you employ anybody and everybody, to me, there's this, there's this level of like power hungry driven individuals that you are driving into these positions. And it's not, it's not when we talk about racial justice, like we're actually pushing away from that statement more or less than pushing towards it. And I mean, like, like I said, this is stuff that I could talk about all day um, and get way deeper into it. But uh, that's, that's just where I'm at right now. It's, it's tough. It's tough for me. Like, this is a tough call. Like, this is a very tough call because like you guys are looking for language to put in 
whatever le leg legislation that you're going to put it in. Um, but to me, ultimately, it, 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 like this, we're talking about life, right? Like it, we're talking about life. And when I hear words are supposed to change something, it's, it's, it's very, it's, it's, it's uncomfortable because like to me, words have been words for over 400 years, but we still have this system called imprisonment. And that imprisonment, like that, that system within itself is doing exactly what it was intended to do 400 years ago. And, and that, to, that to me is like the most scariest aspect of this whole thing. It, it, it only, it incarcerates the marginalized individuals. It, it incarcerates the, the oppressed. It, 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 it doesn't give the benefit of the doubt. It, it's, it's very much so if you're here, it's because you're this, not because you're that or because you could be this or that. Um, I really want you guys to dig deep when it comes to, and I get like, this might not be on your plate, but I really want you guys to dig deep when it comes to individuals that are being incarcerated that are asked to program in jail. Like DOC could, could, could mess up their entire programming like that, just by throwing them in the hole for two days because they skipped it because now they miss a class. So there's so much more going on that is so much deeper. And again, I know you guys said, we're not diving into the deep dish right now, but like, <clears throat> I don't know how to not dive into that as a black man, because I know this is happening to a lot of my brothers out there. I know this is happening to a lot of my sisters out there. When we talk about um, individuals that are um, black, that are employed by, the, uh, by DOC, I want you guys to really understand that number is very, very low. Like that's not even like that's that number almost doesn't even exist in the sense of like who's really being employed by DOC. So ultimately it's like, I think we need to start looking at the opposite side of things because you do not choose to be incarcerated. However, you choose to work for DOC. And like there's a huge, there's a huge difference and there's a huge balance that like I think people ultimately um really need to separate because I don't think like they're two of the same things at all. So Anthony, I want to thank you um, for sharing all of this. And one thing I, I do want to say is I know that doing this work on Zoom uh, in mm -hmm. an electronic format is very difficult for mm -hmm. all of us. Um, if we were sitting in a committee room together hearing testimony, I know that there would be a different environment feel. Mm -hmm. And I, I just wanna say to you that um, I hope you feel safe in sharing, mm -hmm. sharing, the, sharing your testimony with us. I think if you were in a, if we were all in a committee room together hearing this, you would feel that. Definitely, it's definitely. Very, very difficult when we're <clears throat> on a platform of Zoom and we're all away from each other. Mm -hmm. um, also want to just clarify the issue, the question about the discrimination and harassment. Mm -hmm. I think the question was, and, and the first thing we, first time we had really heard any uh, acknowledgement, and it was the first time it was really verbalized to us mm -hmm. uh, in a public setting that there have been um, issues of discrimination discrimination and harassment between staff members, between mm -hmm. the staffing of correctional officers and, and within the Department of Correction. Mm -hmm. That's the first time we as legislators in this committee have heard anyone really say those words and acknowledge that. Out loud, yeah. And that, that was the question from, in the statement from our committee members, as well mm -hmm. as asking the question, because we have not heard any of this, and this is why we're doing the work we're doing, about uh, staff or COs that are people of color and they're supervising uh, white individuals. What's the harassment from the inmates to those staff members? So that's, mm -hmm. that's what we were working around. That's what okay. we were looking at. It wasn't that okay. we were shocked to hear it, what we were mm -hmm. shocked to to hear was the actual acknowledgement that there is harassment and discrimination between the staff members. 
Mm -hmm. and, 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 no, and thank you for uh, words to that before. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, definitely. And, and thank you for explaining that. Like I said, like, obviously jumping into it, like I probably didn't like hear the, this, the angle that you guys were taking. Um, mm -hmm. So I appreciate you explaining that. I think ultimately to, to me, that still doesn't, um, again, like the fact that you're surprised, like as a black man, right? So I'm coming at this from a total different level of thought process, right? So as a black man, I'm thinking to myself, like, I'm not surprised at all. Because mm -hmm. again, it goes back to the type of individual that wants a job like this in the first place. And like I said, when I say people slip through the cracks, I'm saying like, I know there are good people in DOC. Like I have, I have a lot of good friends that are in DOC. Um, whether it's counseling or whether they are actual um, guards. Like I, I have a lot of friends that um, I know put that hat on, put that, put that gear on and they go to do real work. Um, but I also know within that work, there's a certain level of power that mm -hmm. comes with that. And that power is what drives people into those positions. So to hear that within the staff even all over the state um, to hear that there is issues going on. And I'm not just saying like racial discrimination, I'm saying like sexual harassment. It goes way deeper than, it goes way deeper than like black and white, right? So like, like to me, it, there's no surprise because these same people were the same bullies in high school. These same people were the same kids that were like stealing off kids lunch plates in junior high. Like these kids were like, these people were the same people that like never connected with individuals unless it was them controlling the narrative. And ultimately they are the ones running to these positions. And obviously this isn't a guessing game. Like you guys aren't on here to like guess, like I bet this is going on, but like to not, to, to be surprised that that's going on is like, to, again, like that baffles me as a black man a little bit because ultimately it's like, as a black man in this country, you have to, you grow up having to be aware of everyone around you. Like every single circumstance that you ever put yourself in, you have to be fully aware and conscious that that could be your last situation or circumstance. And so I'm fully, I fully understand where you're coming from. And I get it obviously from your angle completely. And again, you said it already as a white person, how could you even like, how could you even know what it's like being black? If you, you know what I mean? Like vice versa. Um, I wish, I wish I was able to have, and, and I don't mean, I don't say this as a, um, as disrespect, but I wish I was able to have that ignorant outlook or that, that naive outlook on the situation because I wouldn't have this, this frustration and anger that like lingers in my life throughout like any day at any given time. Like I wouldn't have this certain resentment towards conversations like this. I wouldn't have this, um, I wouldn't have this, this like emotional reaction to hearing individuals like yourselves saying you're surprised. You know what I mean? Like that, that word alone, like a very, like, it's like a triggering word because it's just like, What's surprising about that? <laughs> like, like to me, it's just like, it, it's obvious. And like, I could tell. And I know one thing that happens a lot when it comes to uh, inmates being transferred to different locations, like they're always asked, have you been the victim of like um, any sexual, like uh, anything sexual that like you may have not wanted, sexual harassment or anything like that? Have you been the victim of this or that? They're always asking those like inmates these questions. But people that work for DOC, they're not being asked those questions at all. As, as a matter of fact, I think it's one time during the application process. And then after that, like what? So it's like to install so much trust in the, the oppressor and to not install and to not see what's happening to the oppressed. And again, I'm talking more so people, women. I'm talking men of color. I'm talking women of color. Like there, like there is, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, women, like to work for DOC, that's a, 
that's a tough job. Like as like as a woman, and again, I'm not talking about color at this point. I'm just talking purely like like a woman walking into that 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 location every single day. It is not that that cannot be easy. So for me, it's it's just not. I'm not surprised that there are racial issues that there are that there are all these issues that are being brought up now or finally being brought up that um, people chose to not take a deeper look into um, earlier in the game because I, I mean it's it happens all over the country and this is this is outside of prisons so I can only imagine what goes on behind these uh, behind these walls. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> excuse me. So we have some questions from the committee. Sarah? Absolutely. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, Anthony. I just want to say thank you for joining us. And I know it feels like a really white space um, being on. Oh, it is. It is. And, and it, <laughs> it is. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and I have to say, you know, I, like Alice said, you know, if we were in a committee meeting, I think you would probably feel um, the, the, like, you'd be able to pick up uh, how I'm feeling right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that your voice is, is, is so important in this. And I just wanted to acknowledge that um, the committee um, has been looking at this. And actually, we, it was pretty disturbing at the top of the session in January. We got a pretty deep dive into mm -hmm. the rape in our facilities, mm -hmm. actually. <clears throat> um, it was... It was uh, it was pretty extensive and it was a pretty painful first three weeks for, mm -hmm. for many of us. So mm -hmm. you're absolutely right about, um, you know, that it, this is about race and it's about control and power, what mm -hmm. goes on inside of our facilities and also in our communities under community supervision. And, yes. Um, and we, uh, some days it does feel like we are really nibbling at the edges. Um, mm -hmm. and I think one of the things I wanted to ask you is, you know, um, while we've been involved in this process, I've been trying to educate myself outside of this committee as well. I yep. mean, I, just to let you know about a little bit about me, mm -hmm. since you're spilling your guts here. Um, you know, <laughs> like I have, I like, I'm part of a multiracial family. My, like I have family members who experience some of the stuff. We have queer people in our family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think these issues are relevant. And I know that there are other members of this committee who can, who can relate to some of this. And I think like one of the big questions that we're grappling with is like, I think at the bottom of it is like, our pris what are we doing with prisons <laughs> in our country and in our state mm. and we have them and we have people in them and how do we make them more humane? Um, and one of the big questions is like, I think that is about like, how do we get different people working in them and how do we make it a better workplace? Cause we do like, we're really struggling. We have mm -hmm. these facilities and people are there and people are working there and people are incarcerated there. And I, I hear what you said are saying and I hear what Susanna is saying. It's kind of like, like there's the, the, um, the kind of a, the philosophical question about like, why do we have prisons mm -hmm. and why do we mm -hmm. incarcerate people? And who do we, are we, what are we asking people to do who work in these spaces? Hmm. So our question that we're asking about this language is about like, what is it that we can do that would attract a different kind of person to work? Like, can we change, we want to be changing the culture inside of our facilities for the people who are in our care and also the people who work there. And what I'm hearing from you is, and I'm hearing from Susanna too, is like, you need to engage with the community who is impacted most by these systems to affect these changes. And I'm a person who wants to get some action. I wanna to move to action. And so I really am looking at you like, how do you feel like there's a lot of, in our state, there's a lot going on with different task forces and different groups and you know giving um, input. Do you have recommendations for us about how that should authentically happen? Like, so that we can really authentically mm. change. So I'm sorry for the long intro. No, 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 no. Question to you and no, I just, no. I just really, I thank you for being with us today, so. No, Sarah, first and foremost, thank you. Um, and I can, I can sense the emotion. So like, I, I really appreciate that. Um, actually, I'm gonna move over here so I can charge my, uh, the iPad at the same time. Um, no, amazing I'm question. For charging iPads and computers. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
No, that, that's an amazing, thank you. Honestly, thank you. I think, <laughs> so we can literally go into this all day. Like this is something that obviously is not, um, it's not necessarily the most easiest conversation to have, but I think, and it's not something that's just like black and white, like, right? Like I say this and then boom, everything's better. Um, however, <laughs> I do believe in the power of communication. And I think that if you're hiring individuals in these power positions that like have never had any form of higher learning when it comes to communication and any form of actual learning when it comes to psychology, the way the brain works, the way humans work, like empathy, if you don't have passion, I don't see how you can be in a position that is supposed to what ultimately when you release people, make them better for society's standards, right? Like, I think, I think having real discussions with inmates and actually developing relationships to me is very, is, is very key to a successful, um, to a successful sentence. And it sounds messed up, like a, what's a successful sentence, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, but ultimately it's like, a few of my friends who are incarcerated, 90% of them tell me the nurses, the people that like the psychology, like, I mean, like just in general, the therapists, the people that they speak to, I will keep them afloat in that, in that place. And so naturally to me, that tells me that what they lack, what, in, what inmates lack the most of is interaction. And what they lack the most of is, um, bond right like a close connection with somebody that like they can cons that they can consistently count on from a day-to-day -day basis they lack that um it's one thing to get that from like a phone call but i don't know how you guys would feel about talking to your son daughter father mother and hearing you have one minute remaining right like when they hear that that in itself is like a triggering like even at the end of a good conversation, it reminds you where you're at. Yeah. And so just little things that consistently like they hear and see throughout the day, I feel like have to be, that, that are positive in their life. And I understand individually um, that changes from inmate to inmate. For instance, some inmates enjoy their peace and quiet. Like that's just who they are, they need that. But those are like, those are individuals that, that like writing, that like creating books, stories, that love, um, again, just like being in thought, like from an emotional perspective and just kind of like sitting there and just doing their time in a, um, in a quiet manner. Um, so obviously there's so many different levels to what I'm saying right now, but I think one of the biggest things um, is communication and like, having an understanding that if we're going to employ these individuals to be in these power positions, they have to also be fully willing to connect and explore the, the inmates life in general and not just stand there waiting for one of them to mess up so they could drag them out of the, uh, the unit. And I think there's too much of that, which is, um, which is ultimately this overall issue like what are we here for like what do like when I for instance as a basketball coach trainer you name it I'm the type of person that um, tells myself like from the moment I wake up like what is my goal here like I know that I'm going to be in a position to affect young people what is my goal here and I always tell myself I will never ever ever just assume because of somebody's age that they can't do something like I would rather overestimate them than underestimate them and then have them feeling that pressure. And I feel like if we start looking at um, positions of power in the sense of their coaches, their life coaches, as opposed to their guards, just waiting for, again, somebody to mess up, to drag them out. Um, I think ultimately that in itself will create a more positive environment and respect will be, will go a long way between the inmate and the, uh, and the uh, the correctional officer, and so um, I don't know if that answers your question, but obviously this is something that like 
we can clearly dive deeper into, like way deeper into. Um, but that's just like a quick opinion that I have. Like I truly believe communication is key and um, bond and developing relationships is something that needs to happen in a, uh, in a space that is intense and not like sad, right? Like, is it, I mean, is being an inmate enjoyable, like, right? Like, is it ever like, is it ever easy regardless of what you're there for? Like, is it ever easy to be there period? And don't get me wrong. I am not sitting here saying there are not some people that deserve to be locked up and the key thrown away. Like, like that. I'm not saying that at all. Um, but I am saying if we're just talking strictly about how to make the environment a better place, I think ultimately um, relationship building, communication, and really evaluating like who you are when you go into that work. Like when you go to work, who are you going to work as? What side of the bed did you wake up on? Like stuff like that is extremely important to me. And I think ultimately when you see what's going on in this country, um, especially with these, uh, these cops that feel like it's completely okay to just kneel on somebody's neck for nine minutes straight. Um, you have to question like, what was he like as a kid? Like, like where, where does this hate stem from? Because at one point I bet he was that kid that like just wanted to play PlayStation with his brother and sister, right? Like, like I bet he was that kid that just wanted to go to the beach. I bet he was that kid that wanted to stay up late and like watch that TV show that his mother said, nope, you gotta brush your teeth and go to bed for it. So it's like, ultimately, like I look deeper into scenarios before I just assume like this person's a horrible human. Like I, I, I want to know like how people wake up in the morning and what their mind frames at because ultimately that's going to dictate how they treat individuals that are already on edge because they woke up at six on a cot that's about that thick with one sheet and like a crappy pillow. So I think like, I mean like, <clears throat> We could talk about this out there. You know what I'm saying? Though. Like, I think like there's so much more growth to be had, um, just in the sense of like how you walk into your workplace in the morning. And I think ultimately that is something that needs to have a deeper, broader dive into for sure. So we really appreciate that because being on Zoom, we walk into it every morning and try to adjust <laughs> to a different world. Yep. Um, so do you have any other questions, Sarah? No, I just want to say thank you, Anthony. And, you know, um, just to say, you know, if you can think about how we can create these thoughtful exchanges, um, it, it uh, out with DOC and with folks, I think it's, I think that's how we're going to get there. And mm -hmm. as uncomfortable of a space as it is, I think it's important to be in those spaces. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you so much. Definitely. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank Sarah. You. So I'm looking at the time. We've only got about 20 more minutes. And Becky has had to go to another meeting. And I want to allow time for us as a committee to kind of start getting our thoughts together in terms of what we need to put together for language. Um, so we have one more question and then we're going to shift gears to um, where we are as a committee with what we want to propose to our colleagues. So Butch. Uh, thank you, Alice. Um, Anthony, thanks for coming in. Uh, appreciate Definitely. your perspective. Uh, that's how we learn. And Absolutely. But I did hear one reoccurring theme, I think, through your testimony that we need to do a better job of recruiting uh, COs. Uh, and therefore, if we do a better job, we'll have better retention rates mm -hmm. and things will be uh, not easier uh, when you're incarcerated, but at least uh, some uh, continuity or, or whatever you, whatever word you want to pick there. Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> you should know, uh, and you may already know that uh, DOC is just changed gears a little bit and now has an office of professional development mm -hmm. uh, that's for central hiring and, and those kinds of issues and they are working on uh set of standards uh, yep. for, for uh, the, the hiring of all employees within doc but especially COs. have you had a chance to have any conversations with anybody from doc uh, 
either through uh, Susanna or uh, yourself just reaching out to DOC to talk about this a little bit. They're, they're looking for help also. They're looking for mm -hmm. ways to do a better job in recruitment so they can retain people. Mm -hmm. um, not, not, I've had a lot of conversations with individuals that work for DOC, but what you're speaking of, I haven't necessarily spoke on terms of that. Um, what I do, what I do sense, and again, I think this could be because of the time and what's going on around the world and the country. What I do sense is a lot of individuals that work for DOC from different capacity levels. Um, I do see a lot of them stepping up and saying, this is not okay. And a lot of them are starting to like come forward, but like, um, and obviously to protect those individuals, I'm not gonna tell you like where they work or anything like that, but there are specific areas um, in Vermont that a lot of what we're talking about right now happens, is happening right now, right? Like it's like literally happening right now because of the individuals that work there. So I think, I think, um, to kind of touch base on a little bit of what you're saying, like those conversations are slowly approaching. And I don't know when those conversations will be had, but I know like I, I'm in a position where I'm ready to have that conversation and I'm ready to listen. I think a lot of that, um, I think I think a lot of the uh, the BIPOC, the black community are, are asking a lot of white people during this time to just shut up and listen. But I think it's also very important for black people to also be willing to shut up and listen on the other end of things. Because if we're talking about <clears throat> trying to change the structure of power, we also have to understand how power works in the first place. And I think that can only be done um, and learned through individuals that are in power, which obviously are white people. So we, uh, I'm ready to definitely have those conversations. And I'm also ready to shut up and listen on terms of when those individuals from these specific um, from these specific facilities and or uh, places, like I said, of power, um, are ready to have those conversations, so. So uh, current DOC leadership uh, is, is very uh, enthusiastic about doing a better job of recruitment. Yep. And not, the time is right now mm -hmm. to uh, give, get, I think, to give them your, your input. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you can, uh, you know, reach out to the commissioner's office or the office of professional development um, that would be that would be great because i'm sure that uh, the, the gal in charge of uh, professional development would be more than willing to listen to your story definitely absolutely I'm, I'm more than willing to help in any way so that being said let's move on committee to an anton uh, your stay on um We've got to at least have a framework of language that uh, Becky can work on. Becky's going to call me about 11 o'clock uh, to go over what, she, what we can do. So I'm going to open it up to the committee members. I know some folks are thinking of maybe just intent language. Some folks may be thinking about DOC. Um, and it's beyond DOC, it's also reaching out to the advocate community as well to develop a plan in terms of how we go forward with racial equity. Um, and then also a member has submitted a proposal about having the state auditor's office do a race equity audit. Um, so, Terry, it's Friday. <laughs> Indeed it is. <laughs> it's Friday, time for you to Indeed. talk. Yes, it is. And so I had some time yesterday to think about what we need to do to go forward uh, with this. And I think back to uh, when uh, you, Madam Chair, and uh, Butch and I were on the committee and Mary Hooper was also on the committee and her mantra was, what's the plan? And so I think that's where we have to, to start is ask, uh, DOC, what's the plan and to address racial equity and social justice. Uh, and in that plan to put particular things uh, in it as far as staff training, recruiting and retention. And uh, Heather brought up the, the issue yesterday when we asked about it is to 
review the department directives, which are badly in need and it's an overwhelming job probably, but, uh, but we would need to have that done. And to, to develop a, um, an, not an all-inclusive list, but a list of other things that we would like to see in the plan, um, a timeline for each of the things that are being developed, uh, the resources that are needed, what cost that there might be, how do we include the stakeholders, uh, and then a, a plan to report back on that plan uh, and how it's going to be developed sometime either to the oversight committee uh, before the end of the calendar year uh, or to uh, the Committee on Corrections and Institutions and probably Senate Judiciary uh, early in January about where we're at as far as developing something to go forward. So that's my, my Friday thoughts. That, that's very good, Terry. I think, that really, I think you may have summed it up for us. <laughs> I, I think so. And I'm, you know, it's great sometimes, Terry, that you get all this down all at once. So it proves that listening sometimes is better than talking. How are committee members feeling about this? Alice, yes, from, uh, I just wanted to say, I, Terry did sum it up quite nicely. Um, just as I said yesterday, I think we need to have some pretty strong language, not kind of just let it happen as it happens. And I think Terry laid out a very good plan. And, you know, with the with feedback to come back or a plan to come back within towards the end of this uh, year um, and so that we're moving along. It's not just being talked about. And again, as I said yesterday, I think it's very important with the present interim um, commissioner there that a lot of this work is, is done and, and put into place or, or I should say moving along and, you know, there will be additions and subtractions right along, but I think we need to have a strong statement coming out of this committee. And I think Terry nailed it. So Terry, I just wanna make sure I've got what the um, is about the plan and what it should include um, that the plan would be to address racial equity um, within Department of Corrections. We'll be looking at hiring, training, review of their directives. There'll be a timeline for each of those developments. Um, the training of staff, the cost, um, who would be included as stakeholders and report back. Am I, did I capture that okay? You got it. Okay. I'm just thinking in conversations with Becky, what maybe she could incorporate there. Um, other thoughts from the members? Butch? Uh, <clears throat> Heather talked about this yesterday and you brought the, the question up about how do current employees get trained. We had a brief oh, yeah. discussion on that. And I was thinking back on that a little bit. And you mentioned something about just doing it at roll call and, and those type of things. But I try to relate maybe a little bit to the uh, to, to, to the police uh, that they and, and folks that have testified today have said, you know, well, these guys are, are similar to police uh, in, in the jobs they have and, and, and what they do. Uh, you know, the police do continuing education all the time for existing employees. Um, they're, they're in down here in Pittsburgh. Ex current officers are here all the time doing uh, continuing continuing education. Some of the, some of the stuff that we we mandate and some of the stuff that's just necessary for them. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, do they need a plan for continuing education of, uh, of, of current employees? Because uh, I don't think that's happening else. Right. I, I really like that. That's why I brought up that. Yeah. 
because that happened. That was very clear when we were looking at the David Carriger um, situation. It was a long time ago. It was back in 93, 94. And, and that really came to light that whenever there was any new directive change in DOC or new policies or just something new that correctional officers needed to now do, they only got that information at roll call. And roll call was not required for officers to participate. Roll call occurred about 10 minutes prior to their shift coming on. Um, and uh, that's why I asked if that same practice is done for that. So. Can I ask a question? Sure, this is open for anyone to weigh in. It's a committee discussion on language. We've talked a little bit about directives um, and uh, what, what did we hear yesterday that there are something like over a- 500 plus. 500 directives. And I'm, I'm guessing that some of those have to do with um, this issue. And I, I'm wondering if we might also, you know, thinking about our, our conversations about furlough statuses, if uh, maybe there's there's a number of different uh, directives on um, uh, racial bias or um, equity that can be distilled into one. I, I'm that's just a that's just a thought in my mind. I, you know, and knowing that there's 500 of them, that's I mean, how does that, how, how do you deal with 500 directives if you're an employee? Right. <sighs> you could say so, on a mission. We'll put Kurt on that. He <laughs> probably already is. <laughs> just, it's maybe not, you know, maybe not part of the language, but, um, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I just wanted to bring that up. I, I like Terry's approach. I like, you know, I think that we've got, We've had a we've had a really encouraging nine months here. Mm -hmm. Our discussions about these issues, whether it's um, what was happening and what we heard about at Chittenden or um, uh, uh, Commissioner Baker's acknowledgement of a of an over sexualized workplace, um, he he knows that there are issues around um, hiring and supervision and, and training. Um, and so I, I think just having what what Terry what Terry said, I'm 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 very comfortable with. Mm -hmm. The other piece there about the directives, I'm thinking of a conversation I had with Commissioner Baker um, just this week, and I, he alluded to this in testimony when he was here. Was it Tuesday? Um, that there was a situation of an inmate who was a person of color and not having water in his cell and his mother had connected with DOC and then um, the staff tried to enter the cell and um, the inmate didn't let him come into the cell. And what the commissioner stated was that, well, they did what was procedurally laid out in the directives. They did what was protocol that was driven by directives. And maybe what needs to happen in looking at those directives is come with a view of social equity and racial equity. Because maybe some of those directives, they can say, well, we did protocol, we did it as it was laid out in, the, in that particular directive, but it didn't come through the eyes of racial equity. So that may be more the angle of really looking at the directives. Just a thought based on the conversation, what he shared with me. Does that make sense to the committee? I mean, there's a lot of directives out there, but it may come from a particular viewpoint. Sarah? Uh, Oops. I don't care which one, Sarah. Or go Kurt. ahead, Sarah. I'll be quick. Um, I, I agree that I, I, I have some slight fear about getting caught up in the minutia of the directives where I think the strength of this is like come back to us with a plan like and um, and I think what I also heard people talking about is about like what are the core competencies that we want um, the state's employees working in corrections to have you know I think um, 
that's a if we can get that word in there somehow or competency yeah competencies like uh, because I think what Butch was saying is about like continuing education and it's about and I feel like that's part of uh, our training and the training is like developing core competencies and and uh, for DOC to identify what those are those competencies are to address equity and racial bias um, within the system. Kurt? Uh, I just, just wanted to say that I, with regard to the d directives, I got the number 550 just by going to the website and they're numbered. Um, there's gaps in the numbers, but some of the numbers have A, Bs, and Cs. So there's mm -hmm. additional directives, but they're all on the website. And you can, uh, the DOC website, so you can, the directives are all public information. But I think I agree with what Sarah's on that. We don't want to get into the minutia, the directives, but I think it can be a statement. You need to update these directives. Mm -hmm. and some of them have been there for 30 years. They haven't been updated. And that came to me from the commissioner as well. He was shocked that some of these directives are 30 years old. And it was a different world back then in corrections and in the world. And also 30 years ago, the folks who were being incarcerated 30 years ago had a very, very different than what's being incarcerated now. I mean, back then, a lot of people were incarcerated just for DUIs. It was a whole different population. They had misdemeanors. And now we're dealing more misdemeanors are not coming in through the door for the most part. Can you give, can you give me again what, uh, what, Ter what you wrote down for us, what Terry's kind of proposing? I just wanted to get a better, clearer picture of it. Well, this is what I'm hearing. Uh, ask DOC to come back to, with a plan in terms of how to address racial equity. And they will be looking at the hiring, the training, and the review of directives. There would be a timeline for each of those that they want to I don't know, would it be implement or that's something to, to look at? It would be a training of the staff, the cost, who to include as stakeholders, and then to report back uh, to either the oversight committee or to us. I would almost say the report back should come to us, not the oversight committee, and have the, have the date like January 15th or January, something like that. Because the oversight committees is going to, we don't know how many times we're going to be meeting. Can I, um, can I make one more suggestion? Yeah. Yep. We've sort of, uh, you know, in, the, in that language, we've got um, the training piece, but, you know, Butch made a point about continuing education. And I, I, do, we mm -hmm. want, um, do we want to really highlight the difference between um, a new trainee who's going through the academy versus um, existing staff in there? Because I, I, I think there's there's there, yeah there, there's a there's a um, there's a big difference. Yes, I and, think yeah. Um, and the 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 uh, the impact. Um, well, I'm trying to think of how to say this. Uh, uh, there's a there's a need for. Um, in what Commissioner Baker has talked about changing the culture, there's a real need for training amongst existing staff there. And yeah. so I think it's really important to, to really differentiate between those two. Yeah, I've got that down. So I'm looking at the time and I know that Phil has to go and set up for House Education Committee because they're meeting shortly. Um, any other thoughts? So one on, oh. yep, Butch. Oh. There we go. So we're going to ask, and we don't have to answer this question today or tomorrow, but we're going to ask DOC to do a lot more work again. So we, I don't know how we do this, whether we approach appropriations is too late for this year's, this current budget, I suppose, but somehow we keep taking money away from DOC and moving it and, and demanding that they, they do more and more and more for the, for the dollars that we have. We need to think about what we're asking. We need to think, and we, sh and we should ask, but we also think about how are they gonna do it? Do the report or do the work? 
do do the work you know do the report and do the work well that goes into the cost and how are they going to do it yep well and i agree but I, they, that's where i was kind of getting at yesterday when we were speaking with heather like you know is this i mean an organization that would do this would hire like some uh, outside consultant to help them do this deep work because mm -hmm. they don't have the expertise necessarily in-house but also to cultivate the expertise in-house in the process so um that might be a recommendation of their plan yeah, exactly yeah. you know like i don't know if we're going to get the appropriation in in these next couple of weeks but oh, i think it's about it's gone i mean seeding, it's about seeding what can happen right um right asking them what are the resources that they need to do this work right it's submitting the plan which then tells you what they're going to have to do, which could be hiring a consultant to do a deeper dive. It could be more money for training. It could, who knows what. Uh, you know, the the continuing education piece is going to take legislation, Alice, because if we don't legislate it, it's not we're going, going to, to hear the same thing. Here it comes out of central office again. Yeah. Uh, Mar Marsha? I, I know it's going to cost money and stuff, but I think this is going to be a good back in for the commissioner of what he's seen and what he's going to try to correct. And he's going to need all the help he can get. Yeah. And Mary's saying the same thing, make the language strong. So I'm pushing us because as I'm looking at the time and I know Phil has to get ready for the other committee. What I'd like to do here, Becky's going to call me about 11 o'clock today because she had to scoot to another meeting at 10. She's going to call me. I'm going to relay this so we can she can start working on language i'm going to relay this conversation and what terry laid out and also include um the costs and how they're going to get to doing the plan and also uh make sure we're including continuing education and training so what i'm also going to ask all of you and i'm going to ask becky the same thing if you come up with something or want to be a little clearer about the path we're on to connect with Becky over the next few days. I know it's Labor Day weekend, um, but connect with Becky. And I'm going to ask Becky the same thing, that if she has questions about some of these specifics to reach out to some of the committee members or send out a whole email to the committee members and have us respond. That's what I'm thinking. Does that make sense? Just so there's more. Mm -hmm. I think also one thing I keep thinking about is to have like an intent language that sort of says, um, re-emphasize re that the mission of corrections is really to rehabilitate and that DOC has a role um, in implementing the quality of a person's sentence. I think those words are really important to have as our legislative intent. So, um, any does that make sense to at least start our start our language with those two pieces? We could. We might even say as a as a uh, department in the agency of human services. Yeah. Right, drive that point home a little more. That. Oh, about the role of implementing the quality of the center? Well, no, that just uh, DOC is an agent. It's a department in the agency oh. of human services. Yep. And Kurt, you had your hand up. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure that we realize we've gone through a couple of cycles here. I think we started out yesterday talking about a report, and then we decided it was too much work for them to do a report, and now we're back to having them do a report. So I'm just, I'm, I'm cautious. I wanna make sure that we're doing going on the right track and not just responding too quickly. Um, so I, I, I'd be interested in, I wanna watch this and see, have another chance to talk about it. Well, we're gonna, um, we're gonna ideally, get- Ideally, I would like to, ideally I'd like to hear from DOC what they think the impact of whatever we're proposing would be on their on what they're trying to do is they think it's a good thing or a bad thing or like that well that would be part of their plan that they're going to come back with no i mean just the idea of what aren't we requesting a report no it's now we're requesting a plan 
we figure out. It's what Terry was saying. Yeah, I don't well, know that I heard it wrong. I thought we were getting a report about how to do a plan. Well, I think we've Sorry. transitioned from what? that. I think at the beginning when we started talking about this was while we could have them do a report, it was just to try to get the idea out there just to see where it went. So what are we asking DOC to do with this year now with this, with this language? To come back basically with a plan how they um, would like to address racial equity within their department. So we are making, uh, we are asking them to do a bit of work, quite a bit of work to come up with a plan. Yes? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's... So, so I think we ought to get some input from DOC as to whether they think they, how, what they think about it. Right, so what we're gonna do is next Tuesday, we're gonna have some language presented to us. Phil's gonna reach out to all the folks who have testified to this point to be part of our Zoom meeting on Tuesday as we start working through the language. So that will be the point for DOC to weigh in. That will be the point for advocates to weigh in. Okay. That's the, because sometimes you're not going to get any further testimony until you actually put words on a paper for people to see what direction you're going in. And then they can say, wait a minute, you're off base? Or yeah, this makes sense, but going to cost money for this or you need to expand it over here okay sound sounds good so anything else before we sign off because i'm worried about phil needing the time to shift gears here sarah no okay anything else okay